Okay. Well, he's really holy, um, Kim. <laughs> They're not terribly long verses. I tend to like all the verses, but we'll see. I don't know that I've ever sang Bringing in the Sheaves, so I don't. <laughs> I'll have to watch more westerns. <laughs> Okay. Well, the, we'll have to have let everyone carry us there. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask Mike, how long do you think they'll talk if I let them? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, that's good. The body of Christ needs that. So. <laughs> um, well, we're recording and now we have sound. So um, let's, let's get started. We'll um, start with prayer. Uh, we don't have a bulletin this morning. Uh, are there any prayer requests that um, you know, Carol sh shared? Uh, Clint and Judy Smith, uh, Clint's mom died, so we'll pray for Pray for their family, pray for uh, them too. Um, there was a post Lance had about a Gamble family. We weren't sure which ones they were, but um, it was, it, was it COVID? Yeah, it was. Okay, so one of them was really sick with COVID. Um, pray for Kelly. Uh, she is home quarantining today, uh, as is Eddie. They, Eddie had a bunch of people at work who had COVID. Um, Kelly had symptoms, so we pray that she doesn't have it or recovers well if she does. Um, Tom and Barbara must have been around her because they let me know they weren't coming this morning and were quarantining. Um, pray for safety with her weather. Ron, uh, it was really icy out his way, so he was staying home. Uh, I know you guys had it icy on the way here too, so pray for safety there. Um, Pray for safety and success of the deer hunters. Uh, I saw six does, no doe tag. Um. <laughs> you know, I like to do that. Okay. Ouch. How's the squaw lake? There's a lot of people with COVID and this week the ambulance went by and one of our neighbors she was, couldn't breathe. Keep praying for everyone out there. Um any, any others? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and just thank you for this time together. Thank you we're able to gather together as your body and uh, edify one another and uh, sing uh, songs to you and learn from your word. We pray and ask that you would uh, bless our time together. We pray uh, and come to you with uh, thanksgiving and, and many requests. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for uh, your providence and sovereignty and, and um, the way you watch over us and promise good to those uh, who love you. And so, Lord, we come in that manner asking for um, help for Clint and Judy Smith, help uh, them as they mourn as his mother died and uh, just be with that family. Lord, we pray for Kelly and ask uh, that you would watch over her and, and keep her uh, under your care, Lord, whether she uh, has it or or not, we pray that you would. Um, we pray that she would not have it, but if she did, that you would, uh, your hand would be upon her and heal her. And uh, Lord, we pray that for the Gamble family. It sounds like they it was one of them had it really badly uh, that Lance had shared with us, and uh, so we pray for them and, and help for their family uh, and for. 
the one who was hospitalized by it. We pray for um, those out in Squaw Lake who have uh, heard from Kim have been getting it and it's been getting bad and one of her neighbors was brought by ambulance because uh, they couldn't breathe and so we pray and, and ask for your help for them and, and healing for them. Lord, we uh, pray also and uh, ask for uh, just safety as people travel and as the roads are slick and and um, safety for those out in the woods hunting and, and uh, success if it would be your will. And Lord, we pray also um, for Shannon. Uh, ask that you would help her as she heals from her dental surgery and is in a lot of pain. Um, Lord, we pray and ask that you would ease the pain and, and help her cope as, as she struggles through it. And um, Lord, we do thank you for surgery and the ability to fix things uh, that need to be fixed. And, and so we thank you for that uh, and ask that you would help comfort her as, as um, she heals from it. Lord, we just um, meet together here this morning to lift up your name and, and thank you for this time together and, and lift this time up to you and, and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing um, hymn 149, uh, Holy, Holy. Um, Kim said I can pick how many verses, so I'm going to... I want to pick I want to pick all 6 149 Him 149 Let's just end it there. <laughs> no, that's not that's not a version I'm really used to singing, and I I, I know the song, but not in those verses. So one or two verses is plenty good. I take it back. Uh, let's sing. Are you washed? Him two fifty nine. This one I do know, so we can sing all four. <laughs> Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your souls be ready for the mansions bright, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin, and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Uh, announcements this morning. Um, Trying to think, nothing's coming to mind. Um, I did get an email from the guy doing our website. He's got a version of it ready uh, for us to look at. And um, so I got to find a time during the day uh, that I can call him and kind of go over it with him. So that's plugging along. Um, we're going to cancel Bible study tomorrow. Um, There was another one. Oh, T Barb was asking about ICTV and the sermons being online. Um, Ron was going to take that back over from me, and uh, well, me and Ron had to work that out. So I'm going to get a hold of him after uh, church here. He texted me. Uh, I told him I'd text him after work or after church here, and and uh, so those should be getting back up soon. Uh, get a better system going on that if you know anyone who is asking about it. I know um, Dan Whitstruck and there was someone else Bart mentioned. They they watch it on ICTV and haven't seen it. So uh, so we're we're going to try and get that going back uh, again. If if you're interested in helping with that, I'm sure Ron wouldn't mind help uh, either. I know I would. So um, I think that's it for announcements unless someone else has something. Um, well, we'll continue singing. Uh, is, does anyone know bringing in the she's better than, I don't really know the tune. I mean, we could listen to Kim. Uh, Lily doesn't have the handout either, so <laughs> should we skip it? Is that okay? Okay. Does anyone have one they um, want to sing instead? You want to see? Okay. Maybe for closing we can do him 258, if you know it. Uh, 107 for Amazing Grace.
Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. The Lord has promised good to me, His word my hope secures. He shield and portion be as long as life endures through many dangers toils and snares I have already come tis great hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we sing God's praise than when we first begun. Let's sing hymn 35, Near to the Heart of God. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of comfort sweet, near to the heart of God. A place where we our Savior meet, near to the heart of God. O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of of full release near to the heart of God a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God O oh, Jesus blessed Redeemer sent from the heart of God Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God.
Well, let's uh, let's pray before we uh, begin here. Lord, we come to you this morning uh, near to your heart and uh, thank you for a place of quiet rest. Thank you for um, the place where uh, sin can cannot molest, where we're free from it. And um, we thank you for your gospel and that we're, we're able to be free from sin and, and bought and purchased by your blood and, and washed in it. And, and Lord, we pray and, and thank you for all these beautiful truths. And we ask as we would turn to your word today that you would instruct us by it, Lord. We ask that you would um, help us to be able to uh, look at it and look at the world around us and, and make good application. And so, Lord, we pray uh, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I'm going to preach from Matthew 4. Uh, I'm going to continue somewhat loosely in um, preaching backwards through Matthew. Uh, I just sort of happened to uh, run across uh, Matthew 7 or 8 uh, where God had led, and, and then it was fitting to go back to the chapter before it, and then it just kind of happened that way. So um, I think what I would like to do is... Um, continue somewhat loosely backwards uh, through it. We went through 7, 6, and parts of 5. i um, like to do 4 today and make it back to around uh, to chapter 1 around Christmas. Uh, and then we'll focus, Lord willing, around the first stories and coming of Christ. So, uh, Lord willing, I'll, I'll keep going that direction. Um, this morning, let's uh, start by reading chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit, as so led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungered. And the tempter came to him. When the, temp when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy, dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, it is also written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil take him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, go away from me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the de devil leaved him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Um, just a quick aside, John chapter 3 is um, about John and John um, preaching the gospel. And uh, just back to the text here. Uh, it happened that John had been cast into prison. When, when John had been cast into prison, Jesus departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and he dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region, a shadow of death, light has sprung upon. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon uh, called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. 
And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. You have in, in Matthew 4 here about four parts. First, you have Jesus tempted in the wilderness. And second, you've got the prophecy um, from Isaiah um, about Jesus dwelling in Capernaum. And then third, you have the calling of Peter, Andrew, James, and John as fishermen made to be fishers of men. And then fourth, uh, Jesus teaching in the synagogues and his preaching of the kingdom in public uh, so that his fame went out. Let's start with the first one, Jesus tempted. Um, I'm actually probably going to spend more of the time there today on, on this um, portion. But uh, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's a striking uh, statement that, that says a lot. Um, in chapter 3, Jesus was baptized, and the Spirit des descended and rested upon him like a dove. In contrast, here, the Spirit is driving him into the wilderness to be tempted. A couple points about Jesus' temptations. Jesus didn't need to be tempted to help him grow. Uh, instead, he endured temptation both so that he could identify with us, Hebrews 2.18 and Hebrews 4.15, and also to demonstrate his own holy, sinless character. Uh, James 1.13, the Holy Spirit uh, doesn't tempt us, uh, but the Holy Spirit may lead us to a place where we will be tempted. Uh, this is not to prove something to God, as if he didn't know what would happen uh, when we fell under a situation, but it's to prove something to us and to the spiritual beings watching, watching us. Uh, that's what one commentator said, and I thought it was pretty decent, um, the, that sometimes you're led somewhere, and it's not necessarily for good. Uh, ultimately it will be for good, but you may not perceive it that way. You may be led into temptation or difficulty or a trial or a testing, and, and you wouldn't see that uh, as necessarily good. And you would ask God, why in the world did you lead me into that? I did not like that. Uh, in fact, we pray, lead us not into, tempt not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so um, w it's okay to pray that. It's good to pray that. We don't want to go into temptation, but... We see here that the Holy Spirit did lead Jesus into the wilderness. And, and so sometimes we're led to areas in life uh, by God. And uh, that's not our decision. And so what we can say for sure, though, uh, is not, this is not odd. This is not a strange thing. Uh, that Jesus would be tempted or that you would be tempted. Um, there's, he says, uh, the, all, everyone's tempted, uh, you know, when they're, they're dragged away by their own evil desire and sin gives, when it's full um, grown, gives birth to death. And he, he recognizes that everyone's tempted. Uh, and when you are tempted, you know, so it's more of a when, 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 uh, when Jesus had been uh, brought into the wilderness, and when the tempter came to him, not as if he would, but when he would, um, we can be sh certain that temptation is a certainty for everyone. And uh, that's true in our lives. It's, it's not a question of if temptation will come, but when. Uh, and so uh, we, there's something to be learned here from the temptation of Jesus for, for us. Um, 
Spurgeon said this, uh, Let us do what we will, we shall be tempted. God had one sin, son without sin, but he never had a son without temptation. That was a pretty good quote, uh, and, and it, it fits with the Hebrews passage. He was tempted in every way like us, and so he's able to empathize with us. Now, when Jesus was tempted, he answered Satan back. Yeah, that's significant, because he didn't silently disagree with Satan. That's a mistake that Christians in the church often makes. Well, you know, I kind of disagree with that. I'm not really going to... Don't need to get into that. But Jesus didn't, didn't just like, well, I disagree with you. And just sort of leave it at bay. He, he answered him. He answered him from the word of God. Uh, when uh, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8.3, Jesus shows that every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, should be more precious to us than food itself. That's an important point. He didn't silently disagree. He said, make bread. He said, I don't need to. Here's a scripture that says I don't need to. In the second temptation, he answered him from Deuteronomy again. Jesus says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. In the third temptation, again from Deuteronomy, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and you shall serve him only. He didn't silently disagree. He met him, and he met the content of what he was saying, and he met it with Scripture. He answered the devil, he answered the temptations, and he resisted them. A yeah, little side note, all three times from Deuteronomy, one of the commentators said perhaps Jesus had just been reading Deuteronomy, and uh, maybe that's a, an encouragement for you. Wherever you happen to be reading through, God may uh, have just the exact words you need. And it's a speculation, but uh, interesting in any case that Jesus chose all three passages from, from Deuteronomy. Anyways, he answered the devil, he answered the temptations, he met the content of uh, whatever the devil was trying to tempt him with. And he resisted him. Away from you, Satan, for it is written. Jesus replied with scripture and commanded the devil to leave. And in the same way, we can resist the devil and he will flee uh, from you. James 4, 7 says that. He's just the devil and he will flee from you. It worked for Jesus. The devil left him and it will work for us. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man and God is faithful. Scripture says he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear and when you are tempted he will provide the way out so that you can stand up under it. You don't have to muscle your own way through it. He's already provided the way out. And, and Jesus didn't uh, really even make his own way out. He, he, he took God's way out. He said, here's the scripture. Here's the way that I'm going to stand up under this. And so he resisted him with scripture. Now, remember I said the four parts here, Jesus tempted in the wilderness, prophecy of him dwelling in Capernaum, calling of Peter, and, Peter Andrew, James, and John, to be fishers of men, and then Jesus teaching and preaching in the synagogue. So his fame went out. Like I said, I want to dwell a little bit more time on the first part today because I think it is important uh, for today. I've, I've often heard, uh, this is not, <laughs> uh, I've heard this in a lot of churches, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm talking about us. Um, although I, I, I have, um, I had heard it here too. But I often heard when a church, when, when I've been in churches that have went through difficulties, and, and um, the response in sometimes has been, it's okay. God has got it under control, and it will all work out. Now, I don't want to be unkind and decry the faith of those who feel that they can't contend with the issue at hand, and, and they just want to rest in faith on God. I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing to rest in faith on God. But it's only good in so long as it doesn't shirk the responsibility that you do have. Uh, because Paul did tell the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, that their meetings did more harm than good. And he preached against divisions in the church, and he preached against them often in many of his letters. And then he gave them how to handle them, which would mean he expected that they should handle them. Now, today in America, and like I said, I'm speaking broadly and not about any one church, I've seen church divisions, and I've seen churches split. I've seen one church over here turn into two churches, and one goes over there. 
I, I remember that as a kid. There's that one over by Ogles, and they're, they're, they got their own church now. And it's like, well, what happened there? Well, we used to be a bigger church, but now we split into two. Um, I've, I, I've seen um, churches dwindle. I've seen that at a previous church where uh, they, there was some division there, and a, and a lot of them just left. And, and I've seen them close. I've seen church, I've, you, there's, you probably know of a church recently that closed. Now, I don't want to say anything harmful about a specific local church, but there have been churches that have closed. So anyways, on the topic of Matthew 4, I'm trying to speak to God's sovereignty. And, and the illustration that I'm using there with local bodies where different things can happen. There are people doing their wills against the will of God and causing dis- discord, envy, dissension. Uh, you know, those things cause very real problems. And God in his sovereignty allows us to do those things. He allowed those churches to split. He allowed them to close. So while it's good to rest in faith on God, we shouldn't have a view of sovereignty that relegates everything to God in a way in which somehow he controls our neighbors like zombies. Like they just sort of, it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen Third Rock from the Sun, and they go, and the transmission from the big giant head. <laughs> like we shouldn't expect that God would control people in that way uh, to somehow make uh, every contention just evaporate. Sometimes there's a blow it instead, and I've seen those things. So trusting in God as sovereign, as in control of the church, in control of the world, in control of the kingdoms of man. When we're, when we're thinking, this is what Jesus was brought before the kingdoms of man. This was one of his temptations. So we should take a view which recognizes the rebellion of man and the rebellion of Satan. And so I'd like to look at the third temptation. Now the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and those kingdoms' glory. And he said to him, All these I'm going to give to you if you would fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He says, All these things I will, I will give to you. Essentially, the devil is telling Jesus, uh, you know, you came, you came back to the earth. You came to the earth to win all the kingdoms of the world and their glory away from Satan's domain. And so Satan says, I'll give them out of my domain to your domain, but I just want you to worship me. And so he's trying to essentially give them away around the cross. You don't have to die on the cross to gain the kingdoms back. Let me just give them to you, but I want you to worship me. And, you know... All he would have to do is, is give Satan what he had been longing for ever since, here's the commentator say, saying this, all he would have to do is give Satan what he has been longing for ever since he fell from glorious to profane. Worship and recognize, um, worship and recognition from God himself. That's what Satan wanted. We're revealing insight into Satan's heart. Worship and recognition being far more precious to him than possession of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He is still the one who said, from Isaiah, uh, Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Satan wanted praise and, and glory and recognition for how great he thought he was. But we know Jesus didn't. But Satan says, I will give you. Now, that makes it evident that Satan has authority over the world, over this world, over this world and its governments. I mean, over this world and its kingdoms. Would the temptation have been a temptation at all if if he didn't? Why would Satan say, let me give you what's mine if he didn't have it? Why wouldn't Jesus say back to him, you don't have control. Scripture says you don't, and God does. But he didn't answer him that way. And, and he, he, Jesus recognized that, that Satan had uh, what he was offering Jesus. And um, Adam and his descendants uh, gave the devil this authority. Uh, when they served the devil, when they became slaves to sin, they became um, children of Satan. That's the way scripture talks about it. 
Uh, Adam turned it over to Satan, and, and uh, sort of one commentator put it this way, after that, uh, all Adam's descendants cast their vote of approval by their personal sin. Now, of course, ultimately all things belong to God, but God allows Satan to function as the God of this age. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that Satan is the God of this age, and, and God allows Satan to function that way. And that's why the world is, the fallen world is in the mess that it is in. So, when we reorient ourselves, when, when we look into Scripture, it is expected by the biblical writers, it's just a given, just a gimme, just expected, that the kingdoms of this world serve Satan. He's the functional God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, so, so, so true is this, uh, that his rule was offered to Jesus to try and tempt Jesus. Like I said, not much of a temptation if, if Satan did not actually control it. And of course, ultimately all things belong to God, but God has allowed Satan to function as the God of this age. Uh, essentially, like I said, this vision that, that he offered to Jesus was uh, invited, he was sort of inviting Jesus to take a shortcut around the uh, cross. You don't need to gain your kingdoms of the world and glory back that way. Uh, I, I will offer them to you. Now, I don't want to go too far into application here, you're smart and reasoning people, and you can figure it out. But the point I'm making here uh, is that ultimately it doesn't matter who sits on the throne of men because that's not the way Jesus is going to save the earth. He isn't going to use uh, the government or a Christian government uh, to save mankind. The way mankind becomes saved is by light. He says that. Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, Behold, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung upon. And that is in uh, direct opposition to Satan, who likes the dark. Uh, one more small word about Satan and his methods in his kingdoms and his structures of power among men. He wins by deception. We're told to watch out for Satan. He's a roaring lion. He wants to pounce wherever he will. And, and the way he wins is by deception, by keeping you in the dark, um, by leaving everything in the dark. Uh, nothing uh, can come to the light of day. For if it does, it's revealed and exposed for what it is. This is why Jesus said in John 3, and this is the verdict, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, and neither comes into the light, lest his deeds shall be reproved. Satan wins by deception. Satan says, it is written. Satan says that. Satan's quote scripture. He says, uh, you know, this is how things are in the world, and, and as it is written. And he says, if you be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for as it is written, he shall give his angels charge against thee, and... In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thy dash thy foot against the stone. That, that was true. He can, for it is written, the devil can use this phrase also. He can point to true things in Scripture to try and uh, twist it to fit his goals. We, we can trust that the devil knows all of Scripture. He's memorized the Bible. He's an expert at quoting it out of its context to confuse and defeat those he tempts. Here the devil quoted Psalm 91, 11 to 12. And he took it out of his context to say, Go ahead, Jesus. If you do this, the Bible promises angels will rescue you. And that was true. And he's, you know, sort of offering this spectacular of self-promotion. Do this and show how great you are. Satan borrowed our Lord's weapon and said, It is written. Uh, but he didn't use that sword lawfully. It wasn't not in the nature of of, uh, as the commentator says, not in the nature of the false fiend to quote correctly. He left out the necessary words, in all thy ways. Thus he made the promise say what in truth it never suggested. So the text is falsely quoted. Poole uh, says it this way, because the devil left out the words to keep you in all your ways, uh, to test God in this way was not of Jesus' way, and it was not the way of the Savior or Messiah. 
God had never promised nor ever given any protection of angels in sinful and forbidden ways. He says, uh, Poole again says, the text is wrongly applied because it was not used to teach or encourage, but instead to deceive. Making this word a promise to be fulfilled upon Christ's neglect of his duty, extending the promise of special providence as to dangers into which men voluntarily throw themselves. So it wasn't that uh, if something happened, God would protect him and he will keep you in all your ways. Uh, it was that, hey, thrust yourself headlong into some danger you're not supposed to so that God will keep you. And Jesus says, I'm not going to put God to the test. Jesus understands from his knowledge the whole counsel of God that Satan was twisting this passage from Psalm 91, and he knew how to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. The commentator, with which I'm inclined to agree, with which I'm inclined to agree with, said, "Sadly, many are willing to believe anyone who quotes from the Bible today. A preacher can pretty much say whatever he wants if he quotes a few small proof texts, and people will assume that he really speaks from the Bible. And so, it is important for each Christian to know the Bible for themselves, and to not be deceived by someone who quotes the Bible, but not accurately, or with." correct application because satan likes to say it is written he likes to advocate for peace he likes to advocate for unity and love love at all costs isn't it written that god is love i don't know if you've ever heard that one god is love but then in the backhanded manner they use that same truth to denounce god's justice they don't want people to know about sin and the wages of sin is death. They just want people to know about God's love. And God, is, well, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this one. I have no Christians who have said this. People who purport to be believers of Jesus have said, well, God is love, so he wouldn't, just, he wouldn't punish people in hell. That's mean. God wouldn't, he wouldn't do that. Uh, they say those sorts of things not knowing the whole of Scripture. When scripture outrightly says, do not fear man who can destroy your body, but rather fear God who can destroy body and, he and soul in hell. When scripture outrightly says, Revelation 20, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. A lot of people like to say, well, it's just poof, gone, burned. That's not what it says. It says forever and ever, day and night, night and day. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And then I saw the dead, the small and the great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So, there's this idea that God is love, and he wouldn't punish people, and certainly not with fire, because that would be evil. That somehow, they somehow want to make God out to be uh, evil if he were to punish people, righteously so. And they're, they're throwing away entire portions of Scripture that says that he will do just that. So, God is just, and he is love. And his love does not mean that he won't be just. This is a lie from the devil, a deception. When you hear it, when you hear, as it is written, God is love. So therefore he will not punish. You can answer back and say, Scripture says he will punish. And so that's what we do. We answer back with Scripture as Jesus did. Small little illustration for you on, on how the devil is really good at this. So this week we were... I, a passage had come to mind. We were talking with uh, me and Lily, and we were reading Revelation one night there. Uh, for whatever reason, I had thought of that portion um, about the angel of death, and I was like, I want to read that part because it's, it just came to mind. And uh, there's this angel of death, and this meteor falls out of the sky, and there's a great... Yeah, the destroyer. So this great 
pit opens up, the key to the abyss is opened, and out of it come these locusts, and, and, and these locusts have over them uh, the angel who's name in Greek is Abaddon and in Apollo is, in, in, or excuse me, in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek is Apollon, which both means destroyer. So this angel's name is destroyer. He was in this pit. He was freed from this pit with these locusts. These locusts go around with tails of scorpions, stinging people, and they've got the power in their tails to torment people for five months. This is the first woe. There are two more woes yet to come. I mean, it's, it's like crazy stuff. And then the second, um, and then after that, the four angels who are bound at the river's Euphrates, so somewhere in the world, wherever the headwaters of the U river's Euphrates are, there are four angels bound there, and at this time, they'll be let loose. And they'll be riding horses that have heads that look like lions that spew fire and tails that look like serpents. And it just sounds wild. And, and uh, you know, Cassie was like, I don't know, kind of sounds like a dragon to me. Uh, well, maybe that's not a bad description. Anyways, these, these angels go and kill a third of, of uh, mankind uh, with fire. And this is another one of the woes. And then it says at the end of Revelation chapter 9 uh, that everyone living saw this, and they did not repent of their deeds of sexual immorality and magic and all these other things. And so you see uh, all these terrible signs, and men see them, and they don't repent. Now, you got to wonder why, right? And I think that you know, we were talking about as well, maybe these events are separated out a little bit. Maybe it's like, whoa, 2020, that was crazy. Let's, what's the next crazy thing going to be? We, you know, we, we see, how did they, how did they not get it? How did they not know, like, this is for sure, uh, like the end of the world stuff? Well, the reason is, is they were, they're deceived by the devil. It says that the devil will do many great signs. And the elect could have almost been deceived, even believers. It says he will perform signs and wonders so that even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. Now, it says that believers in that time won't be deceived by the devil because it won't be possible. Uh, the Holy Spirit will keep them. It says, but if he wouldn't keep them, they would even probably be deceived. I don't know if you remember a while back, uh, Hebrew, um, Matthew 7, Lord, Lord, didn't we perform miracles in your name and cast out demons? And if you had saw someone cast out a demon, you saw someone perform a legitimate miracle, you would be pretty sure that they were from God. Well, the devil's going to perform signs and wonders. He's going to deceive people. And um, this is what 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen says. There was people at that time in the church in Corinth who were trying to deceive the church. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. That means they were trying to make themselves appear as the apostles of Christ. And this is no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself masquerades as if he were an angel of light. And so therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, Satan's, also be transformed in, as the ministers of righteousness. If they look as if they're right, whose end shall be according uh, to their works. And so Satan's really good at this. He's so good at it that at the end of the world, when you should be there should be no question. This is the meteors fallen from the sky, the moons turned blood red, all the signs you see in the book of Revelation. He's so good that he deceives them. Why? Well, we get a clue here from 2 Corinthians. He looks good. He looks like an angel of light. Think about it this way. Think about Adam and Eve. They walked and talked with God like in the flesh. And when Satan came to Adam and Eve, he didn't come as like a demon, like, eat this apple. He didn't come like red with devil horns and a pitchfork so they knew, oh, let's not listen to this guy. He slithered in like a serpent, cunning and wise, with a slick tongue. And he said, did God really say? 
Look, look at how good. They walked and talked with God. They talked face to face in the garden. And they were deceived by an angel of light that looked like an angel of light. Now the end of time that I was just talking about, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, what does it say he comes as? It says he comes as a man of peace and the whole world will flock to him. Not because he looks grisly and like a devil with a devilish horn and pitchfork, but rather because he looks like God on earth. He looks like a savior that brings uh, good things and peace to the kingdoms of man. Let's all flock to him. He brokers peace with nations, just as prophecy foretells. And then we see a one world government and other signs. The point I'm making is we ought not be deceived by the power structures of the world around us. There will become a time when just that will happen. James 4.4 4 says, Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so we have to be careful, as we love the world, not to be friends with the world. We say that we want to be careful there. We can be friends with sinners and tax collectors, and we can no doubt be fishers of men. But we're not to align with the worldly power structures, the worldly controls, the ways of things, no matter how good they look. Because Satan is beautiful, he's angelic, he's smart, and he knows you won't outright accept evil. And so, just like Adam and Eve, who literally actually walked and talked with God, he has to deceive you in the same way he deceived them. There's many warnings to the church not to be deceived. Do not be deceived. Say, do not be deceived. All these in the letters of the New Testament, written to the church. No, there's, there's no doubt in my mind that Satan uses the power structures of this world to do that. I think scripture supports that view. He's the God of this age, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, John 8.44, uh, Jesus says to Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has nothing to do with the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so... Satan is doing all that he can in this world. And guess what? God is sovereign and he lets him. Satan rigged Jesus' crucifixion. He did that through political, religious, and societal structures. And God let him. In fact, that was God's method of salvation for the world. While Satan is smart, he is not wise. He has no wisdom. And so God frustrates his plans, and, and, and yet many of God's people remain deceived, and they think that they can trust other men, men in Satan's power structures, forgetting that Satan has the world in his control. And we can have faith that this sort of uh, structure, this thing Satan has uh, set forth, uh, we can have faith that we're still going to be okay, that things are going to go in our favor. God has promised that, that it will go good for all those who love him. But the fact that it will go good for all of those who love God is in spite of the evil power structures of this world, which Satan sits in power over, and which he offered unto Jesus as a temptation. We shouldn't forget that. Now, I tend not to like to think of the world in that way. Honestly, personally, me, I don't like to look at the world in that way. I don't like to look at, okay, now here's this guy and this power structure, and here's this guy over here, and here's this, this is our country, and that's that country. And those, you look at all the guys in power and go, oh, yeah, they're all in on the cabal. Look at the Illuminati. They've got it all. And um, I don't like to look at the world that way. Uh, I've got a friend who looks at the world in that way. And um, I was arguing with him about this. I said, look, Satan does not control as much as w you think he does. Uh, it's, it's not the cabal. It's not this terrible, wicked, uh, as, as you're comporting it to be. I said, there's believers at high levels, too. And I'm not so terribly convinced that Satan can effectively run his machine. I do think he can effectively run his machine. But at least I don't think he can run it to see his purposes completed. God still acquires his purposes 
despite Satan's rigged world. And then he said it this way. Yes, I'm sure that God has his church, but Satan has his as well. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, that's true. That is true. Second Corinthians 11, Satan is the God of this age. And so we do have to be careful not to support Satan's church. Friendship with the world is hatred towards God. And, and you know, it's probably time the church, uh, I've been watching a lot of preachers lately, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to think about these guys. Uh, they're pretty bold, they're pretty brassy. But you know what? Maybe they're right. Maybe it's time we stop playing nice with murderers and liars and thieves and God-haters, people who say they hate God. Maybe uh, we stop being friends with them. Maybe we say, we're not your friend. And uh, because of the gospel, you, 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 like us, when we were once in darkness, need to find the light. We need, you need to repent. You need to come to Christ. You need to change your mind. You need to place your faith in Jesus. And instead of seeking, because sometimes people will do that. These, some of these, the reason I was hesitant about these bold and brassy preachers saying, look, we got to just say it like it is is because some of them wanted to turn it back almost political, and they wanted to make it about seeking a kingdom here on earth. But we got to tell them what's what because we're the church and we're not gonna ha we got to have our politics. No, I don't think that's the case. Instead of seeking for the kingdom here on earth, it says, I said before the service, we should be praying for thy kingdom to come. It says, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth we want to see his will done, but we have to pray for his kingdom to come. We have to pray for, uh, there's a, um, it was popular in the 90s, there was this uh, group, Maranatha. It's Greek and it means come. Uh, and it, that was the prayer, Lord Jesus, come. When we pray for his kingdom to come, we're praying that he returns that he returns with his iron scepter, that he returns riding in on the horse and the chariot, and we see the end of the world. Instead of seeking to overthrow the power structures of Satan through outward earthly means, we should become fishers of men. That's the message here in Matthew chapter 4. That's what Jesus did. He resisted Satan, and then he didn't go on to Jerusalem. He didn't go to Jerusalem where the power structures were. He didn't go fight that battle. He didn't go get the religious elite. He didn't say, come on, church, let's fight this battle. Come on, people of Israel. He didn't do that. Instead, he resisted Satan. He went to Capernaum. I don't know if you've watched The Chosen yet or not, but that really helps, helped me wrap my head around this. Uh, he went to Capernaum. That's where he met Andrew and 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 Simon. That's where he met James and John. That's where he met Matthew, a.k.a. Levi, who was a tax collector, the one who's writing this. He went to Capernaum. You read all the other gospel accounts. When Jesus needs a rest, he goes back to Capernaum. He had a house there that he would stay in. It wasn't that he owned it. He said, I don't have a place to lay my head. Uh, it wasn't his house. He was just kind of renting, but... Um, he went to Capernaum, a land, he left Nazareth, and he dwelt, verse 13, he left Nazareth, he came and he dwelt in Capernaum, which is on the seacoast, it's the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that the prophecy might be fulfilled, that the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. If you, if you uh, read commentators, they say that uh, Josephus, who was a historian of this day, he said there was like... Uh, 20, uh, 24 cities in this area, in the Decapolis, that each had at least 15,000 people in them. So like the area that he's in, 30 by 60 square miles, is like 3 million people, and they're pretty much all Gentiles. And so he's come as a light to the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and unto them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light had sprung up. And so at that, that time, Jesus began to preach. Verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's not here yet, but it's 
right at the doorstep. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon and, and Andrew, and he saw James and John, and he said, Come, I'll make you fishers of men. And they went immediately and left their ships and followed him. And then verse 23, Jesus went all about Galilee as this light, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Quick, quick note, uh, teaching is explanation. I tell you about something and I explain how it works. And preaching is proclamation. I tell you, here it is. He went teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The difference is not one of um, the difference is one of emphasis and matter uh, and, and manner, not of content. The content is the same whether he was preaching or teaching. Um, preaching, Barclay says it this way: preaching is the uncompromis uncompromising proclamation of certainties. Teaching is the explanation of the meaning and significance of them. Matthew four twenty three: Jesus went preaching. Now, preach, the word in Greek is kerusen, uh, which is the word for a herald's proclamation. A, a kerux in Greek was the word for herald. Uh, you know, the herald, uh, you've seen it in the old English cartoons where the guy comes out with the trumpet, burr, 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 hear ye, hear ye. He's the herald. He's the one going through the seat, town tell, saying, hear ye, hear ye. I have the message from the king. So Jesus went preaching as an herald, hear ye, hear ye. He went preaching a message of repentance. He said to, to repent. Now the gospel Jesus preached, a uh, commentator said, began the same place that the gospel John um, preaching began with a call to repentance. I'd like to just quick read uh, from Matthew 3.2. Uh, I'll read uh, a couple verses of Matthew 3. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment, had, had clothes of camel's hair, and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat, his food was locusts and wild honey. And then he went out, uh, to Jerusalem and Judea and all the regions around the Jordan. And they were, people were baptized up by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. That's, that, I thought that was interesting. Fruits for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say unto you that God is able to raise out of these stones children for Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized by him. And then we see Jesus baptized by John. The Spirit rest on him like a dove, and the Spirit bring him out to the wilderness. And then Matthew 4, verse 12, after all of that, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, when John's ministry had ended, he departed into Galilee, and he went to Nazareth, and he came and he dwelt in Capernaum. In verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he made fishers of men. And then Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And that's our call, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. To teach and to explain, yes, but to preach and proclaim it as well. That all who believe on Jesus will be saved. That the wages of sin is in fact death and separation from God for all eternity. But that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And he ought to be your Lord, too. 
And all you need to do is accept the free gift and believe in Jesus and you will be saved. That's our message to people. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only son. This is the way in which God loved the world, that he sent his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have life everlasting. Let's pray. Lord, we pray and ask that as we go into the world, you would help us to go with that message. Lord, help us to not be deceived and, and look upon uh, things that are um, here on the earth. Uh, to not look on uh, things that are temporary, but to fix our eyes on what is eternal. Um, Lord, help us to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, who uh, for the joy set before him um, took on the burden of the cross and suffered on, on Calvary for us. Lord, we pray and ask that you would help us to have that same joy, uh, knowing that as we go and preach this message, the world will hate us for it. Um, help us not to um, be bought in by um, pandering. Help us not to uh, align with um, those who would uh, try and draw our attention away um, from sharing the message of the gospel. Help us to go um, teaching it and explaining it and also proclaiming it. Uh, I think of the verse that says, Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, that song, Behold He Comes Riding on the Clouds, uh, Shining Like the Sun at the Trump Call, Lift Your Voice, It's the Year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's Hill salvation comes. He says, proclaim, I've come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, Jesus said, to set the captives free, uh, to give sight to the blind, and uh, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Lord, we, we go out and, and proclaim your favor. We, we are thinking forward to Christmas when uh, the famous passage of peace on earth and, and goodwill towards men, you, you came as a light shining to people, uh, and you, you, you did that not in Jerusalem, not in Judea, not in some high hilltop capital that, the, that uh, would have been the way the devil might have done it, but you went, you went to um, Capernaum. And you went to the, the uh, by the way of the sea, by Jordan, to the Galilee of the Gentiles as a light to those which sat in great darkness. So Lord, we pray and ask uh, that you would help us to make application of that, to, to be a light uh, in the highways and byways. Um, uh, not, not looking to go to the highest rung, but just looking to go to every... Um, uh, I think of that other song, In the Highways and the Hedges. I'll be somewhere working for my Lord. Uh, help us to go into the highways and the hedges uh, and, and um, to go along wherever we go, um, preaching the gospel, proclaiming uh, salvation by grace through faith and, and no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved except uh, your Son's name. So, Lord, embolden us, strengthen us, help us to make application of this. We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, if Kim knows him, 258, maybe we could use that for closing. I 
I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow thorns compose so rich a crown were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen. God bless you and keep you.